Uh, we're here to talk about the building cyber and digital literacy in our youth. And we have assembled an all-star panel. Look at, look at these wonderful people. There's a lot of them. <laughs> so we're going to try to keep the kind of the intros uh, down to a minimum. Uh, you'll find, of course, all of the full background information in the booklets. I'm going to ask everyone just maybe to take one minute to introduce themselves and, and say hi. We'll start with you, our award-winning friend. Uh -huh. <laughs> a little bit overwhelming, but sure. My name is Andrew Caldwell. I'm um, a, traditionally a high, high school teacher, and uh, I've been working with um, EECD, which is our education department here in New Brunswick, to promote cyber projects throughout the province. Thanks. My name is Natalia Stefanova. I'm a uh, um, New Brunswick innovation researcher in cybersecurity. Um, I'm also the founder of Cyber Lunch Academy, a computer science school for kids. Uh, and uh, uh, I guess I'm a proud promoter of girls in computer science and security in particular. My name is uh, Robert Esposito. I work at Sister High School. It's the largest high school in Manitoba. We have about 2,000 students. We run the uh, Sister Cyber Academy, about three to 400 students in the program. I spent about uh, 15-ish years working in the uh, private and public sector, worked for the federal government, and then after that, Manitoba's largest telecommunications company, MTS, which is now LMTS, and then transition, transitioned into, uh, into teaching. My name is Charles Bazilowicz, and I also work at Sisler High School. I founded the Cyber Academy um, in 2004, and I also work at post-secondary. I've been working at post-secondary for uh, about six years now in the University of Winnipeg and for the Manitoba Institute of Trades and Technology. And I'm completing my graduate studies right now at University of Manitoba, um, looking at uh, analyzing um, structures within education systems that um, promote technology education, specifically within the province of Manitoba, and, and later on I, I hope to, uh, through some PhD studies, uh, analyze and compare uh, systems across Canada. Great, uh, Mike LeBlanc, I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Blue Spurs Consulting. I kind of have two hats here today. Well, one hat here today. My main hat is running a consulting company. We do IoT and cloud services for companies. But the most recently, we developed a piece of educational technology called the Blue Kit. It's actually a low-code, kind of hands-on experimental tool that helps kids understand uh, IoT using the same technologies that are used in a lot of the mission critical systems today you see running in, on IoT, like so it's powered by AWS. Um, so we developed that about, I don't know, a year ago now, I think, and it's starting to get adoption in schools. And I think you know, it's a key part of digital literacy, the hands-on experimentation, learning, and innovation. Um, so that's what I'm kind of representing here today under the Blue Spurs banner. I'm Matt McGuire. Um, I'm a classroom teacher on leave doing a PhD at the University of New Brunswick. I'm developing uh, digital literacy standards for the province and looking into uh, students' interrelations with technology in education. Wonderful. And I'm Jamie Reese. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer for New Brunswick Power. And also, it's been my uh, utmost pleasure to serve as the ICTC's, ICTC's National Cybersecurity Leadership Council Chair, uh, which some of these folks are on with me, as well as Heather, who we saw on the last panel earlier and some other folks that are floating around. It's, it's an absolutely wonderful group of people that are looking at how to shape up uh, a, a program to reach to the uh, youth and get them interested. Getting them to stick with it is another issue that we want to talk about today. And uh, a great deal of uh, expertise on the stage with me today. So I'm going to ask a few questions and be quiet and let these guys talk. So the first one that I, I really wanted to talk about uh, was that notion about reaching across boundaries in, in socioeconomic class or in geographic regions, understanding how we can reach uh, youth in a broader a way. So maybe outside of the urban centers where there may be more focus or more technology companies or more uh, technology uh, related jobs and, and whatnot. Uh, Andrew, do you wanna start with that? Sure. Um... I think what we're seeing now is that technology coming into the schools, particularly uh, within New Brunswick, is the fact that um, a lot of those communication technologies are 
being spread out so that even the most rural school is getting the ability to communicate back and forth. So as teachers, we're doing professional learning. Uh, we're using technologies, uh, Skype and Link and some of the other uh, WebEx communication technologies to allow us to talk to one another, which is a, just a big step unto itself. And then on top of that, um, we're introducing um, something that's referred to as a, a PVLC. So um, this is a, a, <clears throat> a learning community that allows a student to be located anywhere in the province. Um, they're able to uh, remotely connect in during the time that teaching is actually taking place. So very much like a telepresence location. Um, and, and what we're able to do then is to take some of these more um, fringe topics like cybersecurity is for public education uh, and, and allow us to have subject matter experts uh, to be able to reach out to individual schools. So now their location, if they're in rural New Brunswick and there doesn't happen to be any business that's close by or there doesn't happen to be any um, uh, um, technology, strong technology-based companies, uh, we can reach out to those students so that they can participate in the activities just the same as a more urban student would have that opportunity. So we're making it equitable across the province for students to take place. Uh, we're also reaching out with um, a, a co-op system that's a virtual co-op so that um, students that would maybe only have a few businesses to even attend a co-op placement now can do it re remotely and still be able to have that same mentoring type of uh, participation with uh, students, uh, with other companies that they would be interested in and uh, be able to share some of those experiences with the students also in their community. So it broadens out that platform and allows sort of an equalization in terms of public education. So these types of technologies um, just simply didn't exist until we had the infrastructure to make them exist. So now we're starting to see that and we're branching out across the province that way. Excellent. And Natalia, I know you travel uh, uh, around a bit to deliver some of your Cyber Launch Academy programs. Did you have any thoughts on reaching uh, students in, in, you know, outside of the urban centers of, of the province? We, uh, we actually see this as, a, as a one of the major challenges. Um, uh, there are a lot of efforts going on, on uh, the school, in the school system and uh, from Cyber NV um, to do that, but um, it, it's still quite a problem. Um, and I, I don't think it's, gonna, it's something that can be solved easily and quickly. It's a sort of a, we are still in, just in the beginning of the path, but um, we're talking about delivering specialized education. And a lot of the cases uh, we see schools and uh, students uh, struggling with even basic needs, right? The internet is not working, the computers are ancient, and they have no idea what technology we're talking about, right? They just haven't heard of it yet. So I think the, uh, the, the major issue for me uh, when we are sort of making that leap into this new advanced, fancy, hot technology just came, that just came out and we're all excited about and we're coming to kids that never heard of, you know, very basic things, Scratch, right? Scratch. Everyone, these days in the States, I think pretty much everyone goes in Scratch or at least been exposed to Scratch at some point of time, right? Um, when you go to northern communities, a lot of them, I'm talking about New Brunswick in the north, a lot of them never heard of Scratch. So we're trying to talk about the IoT and uh, you know, cybersecurity, and they get excited just thinking they can do basic coding steps and scratch. So I think we, we, we got to remember that, uh, you know, that before you can run, you have to walk. So that, that's one of the major challenges I think for us, not just for us, though. Mike, I think you had some thoughts on uh, the notion of uh, how do we reach all kids? So we just heard Natalia talk about, you know, maybe folks, they're getting excited about uh, maybe not simpler things, but, but less uh, specified things, maybe not cybersecurity and maybe not right. exact coding, but other technology things. Yep. Well, just to add to the points about the uh, earlier points about the, this virtual co-op program, and I see Brian Gray way out there. Um, 
as a private sector employer, I've got about 100 or so staff, and I've probably hired hundreds of co-op students in my career. I'm a little bit older than I look. Um, and, um, and I've been one as well, and they're always in the office. So this concept of virtual co-op is pretty exciting um, because it's gonna, I mean, we, we deal with remote customers all the day. That's, that's, the, um, that's kind of the environment, it's virtual teams. So this is kind of an extension of that. We're excited about seeing how that might work with these students. So again, just, just want to put a little plug in for that because it's a pretty exciting program that uh, we're looking forward to take part in. The point about um, the technology is that, like I, am a, I come from a technology background. I'm an architect, developer by trade, although my staff doesn't let me develop anymore. Uh, I'd like to some days. But, um, the, uh, but our customers that we deal with, they're not, um, they're not high technology companies. There are a lot of companies that are realizing that you know, they gotta go through a, perhaps a little bit of a digital transformation, they gotta use information systems, get a hold of their data. Um, so they're having to become, I wouldn't say experts, but they have to become aware and knowledgeable about how these tools work. They don't have to program them, but they should be aware of how these tools all work to help them in their business. So when we're talking about educating the um, you know, youth and, and preparing them for these industries and jobs in the future, my point was mainly around um, we shouldn't uh, just focus on STEM students and science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Every student, no matter what they're doing, what they're studying um, at early age groups should be exposed to these kinds of technologies. Um, because every industry, and we see this all the time with my other Blue Spurs hat on, as every industry is being transformed by IoT, machine learning, it just, it's happening at an exponential pace. And when these kids get into um, um, beyond university or whatever they decide to do, they will be consumers of this technology, um, they will use it maybe not knowingly in all walks of life no matter what they're doing. So they should all be exposed to it. And we can get into the whole cybersecurity thing on top of it, but just that point of uh, just make sure when we look at digital literacy, it's not just the engineering and science technology students. It should be every student. And I'm the first, and I'm a developer by trade, um, but I don't actually believe that make, we should make every kid software developer. It's just something that not every kid's gonna wanna do. And, and some kids, they may get turned off really quick and think, oh, this digital stuff, I don't like it because it's coding, right? So our, our kind of approach is more of a, with the blue kid is like, let's just make it fun, experimental, so they understand the tools and the capabilities. They understand what machine, machine vision can do. I can recognize my face. I can talk to a computer and it can recognize my intent of my voice and take actions. If they decide it's really cool, they wanna rip under the covers and start coding it, great, go into computer science. Or it may be, I, that's enough, I, I know how it works now, and I know it's a tool that can help me in my business or whatever going forward. So I guess that's the main point about make sure we don't just focus on a, on a, a specific you know, STEM. And it's difficult, but um, I think it's achievable with the right kinds of tools and approaches. Thanks. Charles, I see you nodding there a few times. You, you have something you're well, in, 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 in that space? In, in my mind, like I'm agreeing with what everyone's saying and, and, and the importance. And, I'm coming at it from a different perspective, the, the, the structure, the, the educational structure perspective, especially when we're looking at providing access to students because teachers typically have really great ideas and, and they're the ones that are pushing initiatives forward and being the innovators for the students because they're in the trenches. But what are the supports that are, are they getting from department heads, administrators, superintendents? And in Fredericton, it's in, in this province, it's, it's incredible to see the flexibility and the movement that happens and the support that comes from the government, from the Department of Education. And, and ultimately, it's, it's that coordinated action that is gonna allow all these ideas and all these technologies to actually happen and the learning to, to come to fruition, if you will, with, with these students. And in order to reach remote communities or uh, disadvantaged communities or, or what have you, um, that absolutely needs to happen. And, it needs to really be looked at in terms of if, if the hub is going to be lecturing and, and delivering certain technologies, how are you gonna ensure that whoever is connecting remotely, their labs are set up the same and the technology is the same so you're not getting the whole, well now this student's not engaged because it's not the same operating system version or uh, the same compiler version if they're working on code, right? So that's the structural element that, that I think uh, really needs to be supported for this to happen. 
So from a, an infrastructure position, maybe to a kind of a framework for digital literacy, Matt, would you like to share with us some of your work that you're doing at UMB? Sure. Um, well, I guess to follow the thread that's happening here, um, I like what Mike was saying because uh, it's, you know, to be a coder isn't, isn't for everyone and I don't think we would want that. We'd have, uh, we'd be, have a shortage in the other areas of, of our jobs and whatnot. But I mean, I think it's, I think it's important that our young people know um, how to, like the, they consider the role that technology and digital devices play in their life, that they know the opportunities um, that, uh, that they have using these things, but they also know how to use them properly, safely, um, in, with regards to their health and their success, and they get to choose those things. Um, now, that's, uh, it's all about their, their rights and responsibilities, their contribution to a common good. Uh, it's also about um, being health, uh, sorry, healthy and safe, um, but it's, it's also uh, knowing how to use these uh, devices, knowing how to use technology for what they're passionate um, and interested in, and um, I think, I, I think to provide a framework for both teachers and students and administrators, I guess too, is that uh, the more we know, the more they can decide uh, how much they want to make that part of their lives. So, I know a few of you have been involved in in different types of programs for uh, kind of reaching out, launch, launching brand new things that never existed, per, perhaps in different regions to reach out to children. I know, you know that we have a, a number of award winners on the stage for doing just those kinds of things, which is wonderful. Uh, maybe we'll look at uh, Rob or, and Charles to, to give us a little bit of a rundown on how Cyber Patriot slash Cyber Titan got under their skin in the early days and, and some of the challenges you faced and, and, and how you uh, wheedled your way through those to get to get to here today? Sure, ab absolutely. Um, so I'll, I'll provide a, a quick context. Uh, our school in Manitoba, Sisler High School, 18 to 1900 students, uh, depending on the year, and we're an academic school traditionally, um, high level academics, and within that we offer our, our, our option courses and our information technology, both networking and cyber, and um, interactive digital media are kind of those two ends of the spectrum and then computer science and coding fit in the middle to support both. Now, that's where it is now, but when we started, uh, you know, I always tell the story, we had 30 students in a class with one integrated service router with PCs and we were, develop we were really good at developing PowerPoint presentations because that's really all we could do, right? We didn't have anything to really engage students with. Um, just at that time, you know, eight, ten years ago. So when we had the opportunity to um, meet up with a bunch of teachers to really be briefed on what Cyber Patriot was, um, I looked at this opportunity and I, and I said, what a great resource to bring into the classroom to actually have students engage in an authentic environment and me integrate this into a semester or a year, an annual, a whole year program. And as soon as we went through, you know, the first round of competition, um, the students, I just saw this light go on. Students were immediately engaged. And we started with four students. And like Robert had mentioned, um, sorry, four students competing as a club. And we had probably in our whole entire program about 60 students. Now our lunchtime program has just over 100 students that we, that compete in the competition, and we have close to just over 300 students that actually participate in the structured program um, to take their option classes. And it's been a tremendous um, tool to engage. And again, it's that authentic environment that, that we really try and um, focus on because they can engage. And the Cyber Titan, when we connected with the US Air Force and we're doing it, it was great to, you know, be connected, but we needed something for Canada. And so when the opportunity kind of presented itself to say, hey, how can we rebrand this and bring this to Canada? Um, it was kind of a no-brainer to, to um, move that initiative forward. And, and that essentially is, is where we are at today with, with the competition and how it's moving forward with um, the level of engagement in terms of technology in the classroom. Excellent. Natalia? 
you've also started a, a, a wonderful program. I'm a little biased because my son attends many of Natalia's classes, so I'm sure that shows, but I'm always, and I'm always a little jealous that I don't get to go if I'm where I'm honest about it. <laughs> um, do you have anything that you'd like to share about the challenges of, of, of reaching children, keeping them engaged, keeping them around? Uh, I think we talk often about getting kids' attention, you know, and getting them to show up the first time. Uh, we need to work, I think, on uh, keeping them around and, and helping them, you know, when we heard from uh, the folks down at the end about uh, finding their path, which, which of these technical directions do they want to take, and maybe you can comment on that. Absolutely. I'm, I'm actually quite glad that you brought this up. Um, we see a variety of students, obviously. Um, we see uh, the ones that are quite advanced and uh, being doing you know, quite a bit at home and uh, with help of parents all of the time. And we also see the ones that have no idea what coding is and their parents just want to push them to something. Um, but uh, probably a big chunk of the students that we see uh, are the ones that have been exposed to something somewhere once or twice. And they sort of recognize the words that we we, we say, but they don't actually have any continuity uh, from what they've started, either in school or club or somewhere else. So a lot of the times they feel like it's, it might be interesting, but they have no way uh, they can continue doing it by themselves, which is interesting to me because we spark that initial interest in, in kids and then you sort of leave them hanging saying, well, if you want to know more, go to Google, explore it yourself. And you know, a lot of the times they turn to their parents and parents say, well, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, so that gap is what we're trying to fill. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's, it's incredibly important to spark that initial interest. But once it's there, we really need to keep it going so that by the time they're in middle school and high school, they still remember this is what they want to do. And then you know, by the time they're ready for, you know, for the software development or for um, an analyst uh, job, they actually, you know, kept that interest uh, through their life. So that, that's quite an interest for us. The other interesting um, challenge that I've noticed is uh, the parents themselves. Uh, I'm glad you bring, bring your son. <laughs> Uh, but it's interesting to see uh, the uh, bias from the parent side. Uh, if it's a boy, it's supposed to be hockey and computers, right? If it's a girl, then she has a ballet and dancing. And it's all automatic, right? You, the parents rarely think that they, uh, there might be some other interest that uh, kids uh, would have. And uh, if you're talking about the, uh, the early age, it always starts with parents. So if parents are the ones who would be a bit more ambitious and a bit more proactive, then the kids are going to be exposed to a variety of things. And I'm not saying the ballet is bad. I'm saying that uh, we sort of have this responsibility. If it's on us, then we have this responsibility as parents to make sure that all the avenues are open. You know, if, if uh, a boy wants to do dancing, wonderful. If the girl thinks that uh, robotics is a cool thing, why not? So that has to be sort of a, uh, an opportunity to explore from the early age. And as they go on, they can obviously choose and narrow down the interest. But it has to be there. Has, the choice has to be there for them. Andrew, as a, as a classroom teacher that's probably seen thousands of kids <laughs> over the time that you've been uh, teaching, what do you see about people that, you know, they, they get an interest sparked, whether it's from an outside course or for something that you cover in the classroom? And, you know, any breadth of technology or really in any subject, I think we can kind of a lot of cross-learning about how people get interest in something and then how do we get them moving along that pathway and, and exploring different things like Natalia talked about. So one of the things that I found has been particularly effective um, at our school, we brought in a, a code club. So um, Enterprise St. John came in and approached me and said, are you interested in doing a code club? And I said, sure. Um, <laughs> I'm teaching computer science and I'm trying to push robotics and I've got these classes that are available. Um, so I can offer something after school. I don't know how much more I can offer um, my students at the school. But I do notice that one of the things that happens in our school anyway is that students tend to um, isolate themselves. So there are lots of activities that go on in the school, but there's still sort of a small group of students that 
Um, some are socially awkward, some are interested in things that maybe aren't as common with, with other students. And um, I noticed over, and they were playing some anime uh, material over in Cyber Titans. And um, for whatever reason, these kids really like these types of things, but they aren't sort of necessarily mainstream. So um, my approach is just to invite those students in just to get that initial aspect, give them a place to go, allow them to gather, um, and for whatever reason, they will tend to socialize very well. Mm -hmm. To keep that sort of interest going, what I've done is tried to find um, some project that's community-based and allows them to work on a project over a period of time. And that seems to have worked uh, about the best. And I'll give a quick example of that. Um, there's another teacher in my district who uh, worked on uh, a salmon uh, hatchery in his classroom and took those salmon and then re released them into uh, Hammond River. Um, and his goal was just to show his students, which were elementary aged, uh, a little bit about the fish and their life cycle. And they wanted to expand it a little bit more. So he found a, a project that was online about cave um, there are these little devices that were stored in the water in caves to help mark where things were and record temperature of the water and um, a few other uh, environmental factors. So he was really keen, but he, his skills weren't in um, soldering and building Arduinos and those types of things, and that's relatively easy for me. So my kids were kind of interested, and they said, well, can we help out in some way? Not a problem, so we organized to get a few of the uh, bits and pieces and we built a few of these um, devices to record over a period of time, uh, designed to go underwater and record these things. So over the course of a few months, we built um, uh, four or five of these to be launched out into the river. So they were learning soldering skills and then they were learning how to connect the Arduinos to the computer, how to make sure that the, the data loggers were running properly, recording data in the right way, making sure they're physically able to go underwater and not leak, and those were all problems we ran across. Um, and in the end, I think there was only one that actually ended up working, but in the process of getting all of those things ready, working with the younger grades and with the community, because uh, the Salmon Fishing Society was very interested in knowing what the environmental factors were like at various points in the watershed. So we kind of brought all that together and that project was uh, a great way of, of keeping that interest going throughout a period of time. And most of the students that were involved in that went into the classes that I was teaching right. the next year, so. That's, that's um, a good example then. Yeah. So I mean, I, and I've been lucky to, to meet a lot of teachers in the last couple of years and, and I hear stories like that a lot about the ability to use technology to help with the English assignments and writing and, and the art classes and, and being able to approach uh, these topics from different angles all, all the way across, you know, a youth's learning area. Um, Matt, I was wondering if in your literacy framework uh, work that you're doing, if, you, if the, you're seeing that type of thing show up as well. Yeah, I, I guess. The teachers, I, we could, in, in most cases, or in some cases, the teacher is no longer the expert in the classroom. Uh, we have this magnificent tool in our pockets or in our devices that allow us to access information. And I think the, the, the challenge that uh, lies ahead now is that there is so much information that we're, our, our jobs and students' jobs is to learn in, uh, how to not only access that information, but how to tell um, but how to discern between uh, what's truth and, and, and what's not and, and what that means to, to their own lives, to their own studies, and to be able to develop a, a lot of skills, a whole plethora of skills that allow them to work together. Uh, we talked about collaboration that allow them to uh, communicate and, 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 and take this information to look at a website, for example, and to say, how do I know that the, the information that's on this website is accurate? How, how can I uh, check on this? Like, what skills do I need? And, you know, so I, I think that's a good starting point. Um, I was mentioning in a conversation earlier today that we really need to get young people uh, just thinking about um, their, their technology use. And, 
and to really critically evaluate that in ways that they're going to grow from that and they can see that fits in their life to empower these learners to, uh, to take responsibility of their own, own learning. You know, when you, when you log on to a website, it's, it's not necessarily like reading a book anymore. There's a whole new set of skills that we need to, to when, when we're just online, let's say, uh, it doesn't even look like a book. There are hyperlinks everywhere. We're scrolling differently. And when students are gathering information, they're somewhat building their own books. It's almost like a choose your adventure. And, and the skills that they have will develop, uh, sorry, will, will actually um, contribute to the quality of, the, of their book and the quality of their work. So I think that's, I think it's really important. Maybe even the theme that, that I'm hearing uh, amongst all the panelists today. So Mike, just, just to add yeah. to that. You know, doctors hate Google. Um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> like that information, right? But, the talking about all the skill sets, the collaborative skill sets, and even that example uh, you gave, Andrew, about the just all different aspects of these systems. In the private sector, um, for our commercial customers, those are the kinds of solutions that are being developed, right? They're not just, and if somebody told me 10 years ago that I would have to have folks on staff that understood hardware, connectivity, I'd be, and worry about things like memory management. For you coders out there, memory management is something that you're worried about maybe in the 90s. Nowadays, you don't. But when you're, you're programming on these, these small devices, you do worry about it. So all those aspects from hardware engineering, connectivity, even the, the use of information and cloud, it's, we see that with these next generation solutions that we're developing for our customers. So those children coming out of school that have that the rounded, and again, it's not just electrical engineers, computer scientists, there's analysts, data analysts, all kinds of other roles that are all needed to successfully deploy these kinds of solutions. So it's, it's the, like the skills that are mentioned here and what, what's being achieved and these kinds of projects are exactly what we're, we're seeing in the, in, in the private sector. So it's good stuff. Yeah. So we've, we've yeah, I just absolutely. Want to touch on, uh, for example, the expert in the classroom is definitely not the teacher at, at all times. Uh, first day of class, I tell my students there's you know 30 brains in here, and then I just got one, so the 30 brains are going to be way more powerful than the one. Um, we're doing an anti-malware toolbox right now for a project, and uh, students go and research the various uh, malware products that are out there. So we spin up a bunch of virtual machines. I let the students know, don't worry about it. If you break it, we can just you know reinstall a new one. Go out, search the web, uh, install as many security products as you can. Full reviews, live demos when students come up for their presentations. And I want to learn something, and I do. Every single time a student comes up um, and shows live demos of all the security products that they've, that they've reviewed and that all the scans they've done, uh, they, put, uh, they go into all the, the test malware sites, the stall viruses on their computers. Hopefully my school vision isn't listening. Um, but uh, the, I've learned so much over the past two weeks that when the students are presenting, and the computer world, the virtual world, is, is, is huge. Uh, we live in a world where we can you know, see things and touch and feel, but um, it's a massive world and I can't know everything. And uh, we have students from, you know, grades nine through 12 and I'm learning every day. And it's amazing to see if you give students the tools, what they can do with it if you're really hands off as a teacher. But it's really tough because it takes a certain type of teacher to say, you know, I'm not the expert and take that step back. And it's like, wow, you're doing something really cool and super interesting. I think you're on the right track. Just keep, keep going with it. Um, and it does take a certain type of teacher to see that. So, I mean, I remember when I was younger, uh, the way that I learned things best was by breaking stuff, right? You take things apart and you try to put it back together and there's an extra screw. I mean, you know, you know all that kind of stuff. And, and, you, and somewhere along the line that gets kind of weaned out of you and you, you try to be always right. And, and I think we find that even in our corporate setting now, we're trying to encourage people to try things and, and make mistakes in a, in a positive sense. Like, try, go try that and see if it works and, and, and learn your way out of it as you go. And, I, you know, I think it would be encouraging for me as a person that, that's looking at, at hiring young people that they come with that skill not weaned out of them, right? It's been encouraged instead and, and, and let people, and I know... You know, we have a, a number of programs. That, uh, maybe Mike, you can comment on the on the Blue Kid on how that allows kids to take that, you know, learning and, and yeah, it's well, it's a core part of innovation, and fail fast, right? And I've I've 
my, my background has been I've, I've uh, successfully exited a couple startups, I've crashed and burned a few others, so, and I wouldn't change a thing. That's, that pain and experience has kind of brought me through to where I am. Um, but um, this whole concept of failing fast is um, it's something we, we use, and it sounds weird, but if you're gonna fail, you wanna do it fast, you wanna learn from it, you wanna move on. And that's how you know, innovation happens. So we do a lot of our work in the cloud. And it was mentioned about the virtual machines. You, could, you can stand it up, you can start using it, you can, you can shut it down. The computing resources that are available today are virtually limitless. Um, and you do have an opportunity with the tools available today to fail fast. So these concepts like machine learning, AI, um, even the voice recognition, facial recognition, all these services, Maybe 10, 15 years ago, you had to go commission IBM to get access to their high-end lab to use these kinds of technologies, but today you don't. They are at your fingertips, right? And they are, they are services that are being used by a lot of organizations looking to innovate, and they're accessible to not just the big corporations, but small to medium-sized businesses. And that's what we help companies do. So with Blue Kit, it was just an opportunity for us to take some of these services abstract some of the, the technical things, because when I say um, a facial recognition service is at your disposal, you know, you still have to connect it, you have to set up an account, there's some provisioning you have to do, but if we could kind of get rid of that stuff and just show a student what the power is behind, like what the capabilities are with these fun little projects, um, that was kind of the goal. So again, as I mentioned before, if somebody wants to dig into it, understand how that works, well, I don't think you know, the voice recognition is that effective. I had some ideas to you know, maybe, maybe make it more effective. Awesome, they can go into that field, they can do PhDs and things. But for the most part, we're all gonna see an environment that is going to be um, um, sort of, uh, like voice is gonna be the new interface, no longer keyboard. I've seen more startups and, and ideas in extending existing solutions to have a voice interface than just tons of them. I was in Toronto yesterday giving a talk about IoT and uh, there was like three demos of uh, services that you can use with Alexa. So Alexa uses a back-end service from Amazon called Lex and that's what it uses for this voice recognition. Part of the blue kit is to introduce what you can do with Lex. So you can use your voice to control objects like turn a light on or something. So we just thought it was important to demystify some of that, make it available in this kit in small in, in projects that kids could actually use. They're not gonna break anything. Although there's a hardware component, Arduinos and lights, they could stomp on that and break it. But I mean, as far as the, uh, hopefully they don't do that. Um, but as far as the, uh, all the cloud services, they can experiment. Um, and in a lesser extent, you know, fail fast. If it doesn't work, awesome. To get that thing working, that's when you really start learning. So that's what we kind of encourage with the use of the kit. And, and we're, we're hoping that through the use of schools, in schools, we get a lot of feedback on just, I, but I gave, a, I gave a talk to about 50 students in a conference, this was in Las Vegas last year, and uh, at the end of it, the kids had a hands-on one hour with the kit, and then I, we, we took a half hour to get some ideas of what they thought would be cool innovations. And the things the kids came up with, like, oh, I really like my Pokemon cards, so I want to set a camera outside my Pokemon cards, and I want motion detection, so it alerts me when somebody's after my cards. Um, <laughs> so anyway, there was just security, uh, all kinds of these ideas started coming up, and that's those sparks in terms of, you know, I don't know what that kid will do, but just being introduced to these things at that early age could have set them on a path, right? So I think that's, that's what we try to achieve, and, and we, we're the technology experts. I find technology is like, we, um, we see what's happening in this industry, but it really takes students, educators, of which I'm, I'm not an educator in, in a traditional sense, but I, I sort of am, but we need all those folks to help refine these technologies, blue kit and other kinds of technologies that make them relevant and, and, and being able to use them. And last thing I'll say, the, um, this stuff's kind of exciting. Last thing I'll say is that given its connected nature, right, of Blue Kit and IoT, even its connected nature, it just positions well with other kinds of communications technologies that'll happen. So you think of uh, even you know, hacking. So maybe it's one school in Manitoba 
hacking against a school in New Brunswick with each other's kit or other technologies that you can, you can connect. So I think we just want those ideas to come back and maybe we implement them, maybe other companies implement them. But the fact that you're, you're, you're living in a connected world, the solutions you're using to teach the kids and have the hands-on should also be connected, I guess. Thanks. The mouthful there. <laughs> Natalia, you surrounded by uh, young people <laughs> almost every time I see you. And they're often uh, learning and uh, you know, making mistakes and figuring out how to move um, from one, one issue to another, troubleshooting. Uh, hopefully not breaking things too many times, but I'm sure it has happened. Uh, in all of those things, in the drones, in the robots, in the, in the cardboard building of, of chassis to, to, to get things to move and light up, what are you seeing in that space about how kids, how resilient they are and how they can use that as a, as a springboard? That's, the, that's quite interesting. I, I was laughing at that when uh, Matt said ha hacking. Um, uh, yeah, that's, that's interesting to see that a lot of kids sort of uh, think from the offense side when you think of, you know, in terms of security. Um, and I actually have no problem with that because I think it, it, it doesn't matter uh, the, what side you're on, you're, you're trying to solve the problem, right? And um, if there's a problem, Right. What's what's the proper solution? And we do see some, some kids that say, "Well, you know, let's just take it apart," which is not how you're supposed to do it. You're supposed to sort of think of a solution, design a solution, and build it. And some kids say, "Well, no, let's just take it apart and see how it's built, <laughs> and then we can figure out what what we can design." So it's sort of the the backwards uh, thinking that's uh, that is also, I think, is, is quite important. Um, um, the, the resiliency in kids, uh, uh, a lot of the times, uh, sort of uh, dependent on the, on the gender, which is a bit upsetting uh, for me. Um, I do see that uh, boys are sort of, uh, uh, you know, Head ready to take and on, and it doesn't, and nothing really crushes them. It doesn't matter what happens. Even if nothing works, they still think it's, you know, it's wonderful. This is the best car they've ever built. Uh, it doesn't matter, it only has two wheels. It's, it's still the best. And with the girls, we do see this sort of uh, perfection, the need for perfection. And you've been to our, uh, the demo session where um, the final results are absolutely astonishing from both sides, but the girls do tend to doubt, doubt themselves. And um, you see them sort of uh, uh, surrounded by parents, grandparents, friends, everyone wants to give a hand and, and they're willing to accept that. And the boys, they say, no, that's mine. You know, I like it just the way it is. <laughs> Don't, don't touch it. And I think it, it's coming, um, again, it's coming from, um, from us, in, you know, uh, to some extent. That's how we sort of built uh, um, uh, our kids, uh, um, the, uh, how we raise our kids. Um, and that's how they, they cope with the problems they see, right? Whenever the, there's a problem and the way they, they sort of uh, uh, tend to solve the problem also comes from, from us you know, from, from school, from parents, from their friends, and uh, that's another thing I think we, we need to think about, especially maybe on the school side when, you know, the problems come up. Maybe we can sort of, uh, uh, I've heard this, word, this a couple of times, negative encouragement, use negative encouragement for boys sometimes, say, no, 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 that's, that's not good enough. Yeah, you, may, you, can, you should try a bit harder and, you know, build your car with four wheels. And with girls, use the positive encouragement, right? It's, it's, you know, it's more than wonderful. It's, it's unbelievable that you were able to uh, go that far, think that much, and you really come up with this many decisions for this wonderful design and still able to build this uh, amazing robot. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, the, the kids' resilience is gonna go further and that's why we're gonna end up with middle school losing uh, girls uh, in science and then high school uh, uh, with pretty much no girls looking at computer science as, as a career. Um, and again, it starts from that early age where we sort of say, go explore, and then everyone goes and does it differently. So, Jeff, go ahead. Uh, so, Jamie, uh, fail fast. I like that. And uh, Andrew was talking about how he brings in uh, to his club certain students, certain demographics that might not normally be accepted, so to speak. And, and what I'm sensing from a lot of the panelists is something that... Um, uh, is considered growth mindset, right? Growth mindset, and what 
And what that really is, is having students become aware that failing is not necessarily a negative thing. And through that awareness, they develop the resilience. And it's really cool that it's happening in technology, but it can also relate and be applied to other areas of life. And we all know that life presents adversities all the time, left, right, and center. So it's, it's great that as educators and as, as all of us that are around kids and impacting kids that we keep growth mindset at the forefront of what we're doing and, and, and have kids aware that failing is not necessarily a bad thing. They'll learn from it, develop that persistence, that resilience to be able to achieve whatever it is that they want. And that's fantastic. Yeah, sometimes I'll say, learn fast or fail fast, but then learn fast comes right after it because that's exactly what, what happens from failing. So I heard a, a joke the other day about machine learning and it said if you're, you know, if you're failing a, as a person, you, ought, you, know, you make a mistake and you make a mistake and, and maybe people will get down on themselves on that or they'll, or they'll get teased about it. But if you do it fast enough, then it's called machine learning and you can get paid a lot of money. <laughs> Uh, Matt, did you uh, have any? I was just, yeah, I mean, I like what these gents are saying um, <clears throat> to piggyback on the growth mindset too, is that um, a common theme that, uh, that I've been reading about is the, a real skill is the ability to learn, unlearn, and then relearn. Mm. And I think That's that, uh, that yeah. falls into the failing fast. Uh, and and um, to your point, Charles, um, is that a lot of the um, tech operations, the tools that that we're finding places for in our education system are perfect ways uh, for young people to do that. Um, algorithms and, and coding and, and those types of things, there is a quick response of a failure. If, uh, if this doesn't align, if this doesn't line up, then you're not gonna get the, uh, the anticipated result that you wanted. But it's a quick movement. Uh, you assess the situation, you look at what you uh, can do better, maybe what you did wrong, and then you fix that, and then you move forward from there. So, I think there is, a, is a, a big place, and I like what Charles said about trickling down into other uh, areas of learning too, because I think that's important. Um, the education system is, it's, it's a, a lot of limbs, and they're all connected, and, and if we take things that we, that we learn from each place and we, we're building our knowledge, we're, we're um, this is a growth mindset. We're moving forward. Um, yeah, so that's, I think that's a key stake in all this. Just yeah, like to sure. add, uh, for example, in the Cyber Patriot Cyber Titan competition, uh, they break their machines all the time. And uh, you watch them right away. They're extracting a new virtual machine, they're right back at it. And th this competition goes, uh, for example, all from October all the way to February. There's about four, there's a practice round plus four online, online rounds of competition. And it's six hours long. So I've seen students make mistakes for you know, the first hour or two, but they're so passionate, so interested that uh, they're getting right back into the seat and, and driving forward. So that's a, that's a good benefit of a, a program like CyberDite and, and some of the other ones that we've heard about in the last couple of days. Do you have some other thoughts on the benefits of kind of organized competition type uh, programs for students like that? Yeah, I mean, at the, we see it like in our, in our programs, we have 100 students that, uh, that, that, per, that participate in the, in the Cyber Defense Club. Um, and uh, it, it's amazing to see how interested they are to then take the classes that, that's offered through our, our program. We offer eight, eight, eight cybersecurity slash operating systems computer building classes. Um, and they just want to keep on coming back for more and more information. As the competition grows year after year, and as they attend multiple different competitions, we offer several uh, throughout the year, uh, they, con they keep on wanting to build, build the skills, solve the puzzles. Um, and it, it's a video game, but it's, it's a real life video game. Um, and it's really built in a world that we can recreate and actually feels real. So some of the worlds that we create in our classroom, if I took someone off the street and I put them um, in, our, in our room, or really this could be done remotely very easily, um, we have a full integrated system from, uh, we have uh, all the websites, we have an e-commerce website selling something, Active Directory running X amount of workstations. Um, and it really looks, it really feels like, the, like a real, world to them, um, and they wouldn't know very, any different than surfing the internet at their home machine. Mm -hmm. But the difference between, between that world uh, and really the real virtual world is that, that we can shut it down at any point, we can reset it, we can break it, we can do anything. Uh, for example, in our cybersecurity class, uh, one of our final exams um, is, a, is an image, and all the students break into teams, 
um, and this image is created uh, with a bunch of malware, there's a bunch of backdoors on the machine, uh, there's a scenario. And uh, for example, one of our scenarios is uh, you're in the Middle East, um, and uh, you've just infiltrated uh, a terrorist cell, and uh, there's a bunch of information on the computer that they have to decode, messages are encrypted, uh, we set up a bunch of cloud services like Google Drive, we have information on there. Um, and uh, as a, so the, it's kind of strange coming from an exam teacher point of view, the lights go off, Transformers music gets turned on, and the students are like, go, and they're in these virtual machines, everything gets turned on, um, and they're, they're solving all these things. And as they're doing that, I'm, a, I'm at my machine, and I'm hacking their machine. So I'm using Talnet, I'm RDPing in, I'm using VLC, TeamViewer, and I'm shutting down computers. And as, as I shut a machine down, you hear the kids in the bathroom like, oh, no, they got us. <laughs> um, and then I have a script that runs, and it says, like, you've been defeated, and then the machine resets, and, and the, they're breaking the machines, they're getting back into the game. But then it, it branches into the real world where they're looking at, for example, they're looking at pipelines throughout, like, Iraq and Iran, and they're figuring out where the terrorists are going to hit next. And then, for example, they were going to, uh, these you know, students have figured out that they're going to hit this exact pipeline, which is a major oil field in Iraq called the Basra Line. And then there's an actual trading account that they found deep into the, in the registry that's encrypted that they had to decrypt, which leads to a trading account that we set up online. And somebody's actually going long oil because as the pipeline blows, they're going to make money on the other end. So you're taking the finance world, you're taking the you know, cybersecurity world and everything, and you're intertwining it into what feels real to the students. And I kid you not, every day when that ends, they're like, we can't wait till tomorrow's exam because we want to keep going. Because this can go on for like two weeks, right? Like they just keep on wanting to find more and more puzzles. And it, it keeps us busy because we're trying to figure out all these new scenarios over and over. They actually want to come and take the exam. Like, they're like, when's the exam at the end of the year? It's like, actually, it's the beginning of the year. Don't worry. It's, you know, we're going to have to get through all this stuff. And that's why they're super pumped to take our courses because that's just how it goes. And one of the things that we're encountering now, education is a game of numbers. Like butts and seats is essentially funding for your school, for your school division. We don't have a numbers problem. We haven't had a number, well, almost, we have too, almost too many numbers. Um, but we don't ever have to worry about our enrollment dropping just because of the, 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 the structure of the program is so clear. It connects the post-secondary. It's engaging from a curriculum perspective and from a, an authentic learning uh, perspective. And, Students just see the pathway, the, the pipeline to entry-level employment opportunities, but ultimately we very much are promoting going to post-secondary because a lot of industry want to see, um, they want to hire students that are 19, 20, have some life experience, maybe worked a part-time job, so we're really promoting that post-secondary connection. And um, yeah, it's, it's just a recipe that is, is, is really, really working for us. So, is I may be mistaken, but I believe you guys made some changes in the actual charter of your school, if you want to call it that, to be able to pull some of these things off over, you know, a number of, of years to... Yeah, well, we, you know what, we had a lot of headwinds. Um, we had a lot of barriers because, like I mentioned, we, were an, we are an academic school, so our school district had a hard time really, like, conceptualizing the fact that this academic school is delivering what really were classified under a vocational program, even though we're promoting math and we're promoting computer science, right? We're trying, we're telling students get a good broad education, not just like, not just tech, good broad education. And, and ultimately, um, I think we made enough noise and we had some tremendous support from our principal, Dr. Heshka, that um, our proposal that we had developed got on the lap of the right person. So at the time it was, um, uh, Mr. Sel Mr. Selinger was uh, uh, leading the NDP government in our province and he took a look at it and they started contacting us to say we want to support this initiative. Uh, what do we have to do? And um, along with some financial and funding contributions, we also had a rebranding because um, the branding matters, protect the brand, right? Uh, we needed to be like a designated, like not a Cisco Academy, which everyone wants to pop up an academy these days. But it's, it's, we needed to be that identity, and the Cyber Academy was kind of born, and now we have a sign in the front of our school, so it's like Cisla High School Cyber Academy. So that could also be why our numbers are so high, because it's every day we're promoting ourselves right at the front of the school. But it, it helped, having that identity and the right support. And I should also mention, uh, Robert was talking about the really engaging uh, uh, image final exam that we do in our, our Cyber Essentials class, but sitting over here, uh, to my right is Nick Dixon, and he's our mentor 
uh, for our teams, and he's been our mentor since he graduated from uh, Sisler High School. He currently works in industry at Great Rest Life, and he develops some tremendous business scenarios. So what's also unique about this full program is you start to see people like Nick and others come back and want to contribute to the success of that program. So it, it's almost easier, you wonder how, like, how do two teachers build this, this program, it's, it's not just us, it's guys like Nick, other graduates, mostly Nick, that, um, <laughs> that really, really contribute and it's, it's such a big deal and it's great to have that community build that capacity so people aren't burning out and we see the real longevity in our careers because of the support system that we have. Excellent. That's a very good uh, point and maybe we'll, we'll come back onto this end and let everyone go down through with some thoughts on how people like me or the industry folks in, in the room or in our communities back at home can help. How, you know, we can be mentors. I think that's a, a, a great start. But are there other ways that we can be involved? So I think uh, for us, we've got a, a fairly strong uh, education that sees technology as being valuable in the province. So um, we're very fortunate that, that um, size in New Brunswick can actually work to our advantage in the fact that we know each other uh, fairly well in the education community and we can approach with new ideas and bring those ideas into the classroom. So when it comes to making industry work um, with us as partners, that's the, the spillover that's sort of really strongly now starting to, to make those connections. So um, when we're developing new curriculum, having like you, for instance, Jamie, help us to say, okay, well, these are the basics, right? So then we can approach other partners like Natalia and say, okay, if, if these are our basics, then maybe what's the next offshoot? And um, if there's a pathway towards college, what's that pathway look like? If there's a pathway towards university, what's that look like? If there's a pathway towards university, uh, sorry, to industry, then what does that look like? And are there overlaps? And what can we do to bring that together? So if we can get those ideas coming into education as a whole, and that big umbrella to say, okay, these are the overlaps, we're the education specialists, we'll, we'll figure out how to meet our needs in terms of students and delivery, and if we can get your ideas of, of what needs to happen and what levels we can maybe attain the students to get to, that's really where it's really starting to work well for us right now, um, and, and we're getting there. and, and, and we can only appreciate how much that contribution from all of these other areas really means to us. So having us uh, uh, integrate all of these different aspects into curriculum development, that makes a huge benefit. So for all of the other people that are out here that may not be associated with us, please do make contact <laughs> with, with the education system because we rely on on you to provide some of that help. So not only is it resources in terms of money, but there are other resources like the IoT kits that are being developed. Those things can act as resources that maybe in education we can't come up with, but you're thinking about in industry that we can use to help develop. So those are all those key components that we need to, to have in education. Natalia, you have a bit of a a split personality. I guess you work in education and you have, have the, the Cyber Launch Academy uh, on the go. Is there um, a way industry can help in, in those, both of those, I guess, or research and education at the post-secondary level and in for, for small organizations looking to uh, help the youth get involved? I, um, I, I really like what, what Andrew is saying, the collaboration is the key. The, the shift that we've been saying uh, lately uh, going from, you know, look at just the postgraduate students, you know, wait till you finish, till, wait till you, till you graduate from college, university, and then we'll talk. Now we're shifting this attention and we're saying, well, let's talk while you're in college, let's talk while you're in school. And it's especially important, even, you know, being from, uh, being at university, it's especially important for us to see that industry involvement throughout the, uh, uh, throughout all the years while students uh, in, at the university they see the, the career much closer than they thought they would. 
So that's, that's a huge encouragement for them. Instead of just waiting to engage and you know, once, once they're out, moving that initial contact to high middle school, uh, maybe even elementary school. So if, yeah, that, that there are different possibilities. And then keeping that engagement um, in various forms. It doesn't have to be financial, but it can be ideas, can be you know, just uh, various interactions is extremely important. That sort of gives that, that, uh, that future career, future choice, that uh, a bit more tangible uh, feeling. Rob, do you have? Um, yeah, I know that, for example, working in the private sector for a number of years, um, you know, the needs of the business come first, and it's a busy, busy world for sure. Uh, the biggest thing that I would suggest is uh, industry uh, really um, kind of uh, take light in terms of for example, if you do see a program that's, that's doing really unique things um, uh, for students, whether that be in the, in the secondary level or post-secondary level, uh, send, a quick, send a quick email um, uh, uh, from the company. Uh, like, for example, if a chief operating officer, chief technology officer, for example, of a major organization can, can send an email over to that school division, like the superintendency or, or, or someone in the political system, it really supports what the teacher's doing in the classroom. Um, and it goes a long way because there, there's some programs that a, a teacher puts in a ton of time, and the support is there, um, but the, the powers that be may not fully understand how, that's, um, how, how, how much support that, te that teacher requires or what they're doing is really groundbreaking, and then the program will, will unfortunately at some points fold um, just due to potential numbers, like numbers get a little bit low and all of a sudden the program folds and all that work over the years is, is, is kind of over. Um, so for industry to see a, a program really breaking boundaries and just a quick email, like we really support this program, um, what can we do to help? And, and like I said, it, it is needs of the business first. There's, there's, a lot of go, there's lots of going on uh, from day to day, but just kind of reaching out to, to, to the politicians and to the, the school division saying this is something that we do need in our community. Charles, did you have anything to add well, to your earlier everything, comments? Or? Everything's been articulated quite well here. Um, from the industry perspective, I think Rob, Robert really, really nailed it, right? That support is key. Um, we've seen it firsthand. And to his point, we, we are seeing a lot of junior highs and elementary schools are actually removing computer labs. Um, and they're, they're going either completely and, and they're giving teachers more computers. And we're not quite sure why that shift is happening, but that's our feeder program, right? So, you know, Robert's example, that would potentially help our school district to p potentially provide vision for where things are going, if that's their priority. Every division has different priorities. Um, the other, this isn't necessarily um, industry focused, but the one thing I'm really passionate about, and I know that it's happening here uh, in, in Fredericton, is, is the, uh, Ability, and if you talk about um, equality, it's, it's providing students those pathways to post-secondary. And whether it's through dual credit or advanced standing courses, um, I think that that is such a tremendous motivator for students to be able to have that, whether it's an MOU with the Department of Ed and the two schools or just between the two schools, because there's all these different strategies and mechanisms that are working for different pockets. Um, students are smart. I know. We're talking about how to engage in, in the different competitions and, and tools we'll use, but when you ask them at the end of the day, what are they looking for? They want to go to post-secondary and get a wage-sustaining employment that's going to allow them to have a quality life. Like, that's their objective. That's their goal. They're smart, even in grade 10 and 11. So that pathway, that relationship to post-secondary, and if they can save some money on tuition, that's huge for any student. So that's, that's what I'm really passionate about. And I don't know how industry can help with that, but it's just, that's a really important piece of the big puzzle. Great, you next? Be sure. Um, all excellent points. Um, actually, the most recent point too about the, uh, how industry can help. I mean, we've, we've been in programs before where, well, starting in post-secondary, um, sponsored a student and sort of, uh, and this is through one of my former companies did it, but yeah, when they graduated, they had a full-time job. But it's funny, I'm thinking, if, if you look at the skill sets that they're getting with, let's say, it's technology, in this case, it was computer science. They can work anywhere they want. I, don't, I, I wonder if kids worry about sort of job security in some of these fields, but, but maybe they do. 
Anyway, um, but it's like we're just hard to find people these days. Um, but uh, I could tell you what's working for us. And maybe it was an anomaly, I'm not sure. Um, but when, like when we got a blue kid into the school and started getting tremendous feedback from students and teachers and all the education staff, and even, even the, um, the folks in government who ran the infrastructure for the schools. Um, it's one thing I think was mentioned earlier, if you have a cool new piece of ed tech and it doesn't work, then it doesn't work. It, you know, you're, you're, you're missing a lot on it. So I think that collaborative um, um, environment between public and private sector um, really worked well. So we're looking forward to just getting that that feedback and you know I'd like to see a lot of other private sector companies and what we're hoping that we can do eventually is then attract industry so you look at an organization like um, like a McCain's well agriculture and Internet of Things is is you know that that's a key application for it. cloud computing machine learning all those things so their next generation workforce should be exposed to those kinds of things so how can we get those kinds of things be put into classrooms and it, it, it takes private sector to help with that. Like they're the ones that are faced with these problems of the, just the, the big data problems and how to solve them. But introducing some of those concepts and what machine learning can do through different kinds of programs is important. So public private sector collaboration. And again, what's been working for us is we're getting tremendous feedback now that's helping us refine the product and, and make sure it's, it's useful um, and eventually in different domains. Um, so that's, that's been useful for us. And just one more quick point. You asked about the competition and how that's been working. Just, and that's just something I just was thinking about just now, but it's kind of how the, the industry works. When you look at the bad guys and the good guys, it's kind of like this, right? So the competitive nature of the cyber programs, cyber titans, is it's actually, that's a healthy thing, right? I never thought about it that way, but just the fact that you know, we want to win, and they want to win, and it's kind of like this. So you almost have to have that competitive spirit to be successful, uh, to, to 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 defend and be proactively defend. So again, I, I never thought of it that way until you asked that question. So I just wanted to make that point that it's totally relevant. Yeah, and I guess looking through my own lens, um, it's my role in in helping develop the digital literacy framework is that. Uh, once this is presented, uh, our, next, our next stage in this process is a consultation phase. And, you know, um, the students and teachers are going to be very important, but uh, other education stakeholders like the private industry are going to be uh, important as well. And, and, and to um, provide us with that feedback, and we can use that. And then the next stage will be the implementation. And, again, it's, it's, uh, it's the resources. It's being part of our school community is very, very important. Um, a teacher might uh, be teaching subject areas, visual arts, the teacher, uh, in my opinion, would be smart to bring in visual artists into the classroom and to um, describe their talents and to uh, take students through from their perspective what they've done. And uh, the more opportunities we have to share and collaborate, I think the, the better off we'll be. Right. So there is uh, one message from each of your uh, aspects or from your backgrounds or your projects that you want to make sure that everybody in the room understands and gets before they leave what what would you like to share Andrew? <laughs> that's a, a great question yeah. uh, you want a short answer and now I'm stumbling on <laughs> to think. Um, I, I think the the biggest thing is to um, encourage the people around you we, we have to make a change in culture and uh, Natalia had mentioned this a little bit earlier but parents have a big influence on students and currently, I'm still not seeing that change, not only in sort of gender, um, making sure those stereotypes are, are different, but just in terms of cybersecurity, how vulnerable we all really can be in terms of what we own, in terms of our own data. Um, and, and we all need to really be um, encouraging students to make a change. So that's what I would like everyone to Natalia? I, I, I agree that there are so many messages I would like to send, so I don't know which one is, is, Pick a couple. is the best. <laughs> um, but um, uh, thinking in terms of security, I think what's important for us is to keep in mind that kids are smart, much smarter than we are a lot of cases. So it's, you know, the parents' involvement should be there. We should you know, 
keep in touch, be involved. You should be there. Even if you don't understand anything, just being next to your child um, it, it will, will pay off. Um, it's amazing to see what's happening in, in New Brunswick. Uh, when we introduced the, the Cyber Titan program, New Brunswick went from you know, one, one essential team to I think believe 40 or 50, 50 teams in, in a blink of an eye. Um, but what I hear like in Manitoba and traveling uh, throughout Canada and in the United States, there's still a lot of pushback in, in a lot of these technology programs coming from administrators, school divisions, um, all the way up the chain. We live in a globally competitive landscape. If we don't get our act together, someone's going to essentially come in and, and, and take it uh, from us. And technology, as Micah stated, uh, it, it, its tentacles are moving into every single industry and it's disrupting the entire globe. Um, you know, the massive deflationary effect that we've had over the last, since the great financial crisis in 2008 is a good example of that. Um, like, for example, look at mail. Can you imagine if, if email never existed, how big the post office would, would be, for example. Um, so at the, at the end of the day, um, even in, the, in this virtual world that is growing at, at an exponential rate, uh, cryptocurrencies, for example, which hit nearly a trillion dollars of market cap, literally recreated the entire banking system in, in less, in, in about a 10 year span. Bitcoin was really first released by an unknown person on a message board in 2008, um, and which took centuries to build. Uh, and in 10 years has a trillion dollars and spans the globe in, 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 in an un pretty much attained process. Um, and if, if we don't get on board and we, and we don't really make these changes uh, in this globally competitive landscape, um, there will people, there'll, be, there'll be countries that, that beat us to it. And, and money moves from east to west and it's done, it's done, th uh, done so throughout history and it, there's no difference uh, in, that, in that. Thanks. So my, my advice, I think would, really what I try and tell my students and what I would hope others would tell their students is really just set goals. Set some goals. Set your goals and have some perseverance and some good work ethic to try and reach those goals, whatever they are, right? Because at the end of the day, are all 300 students in our program all going to work in the tech sector in Manitoba? No, right? So happiness and success can be measured in different ways and whatever goals people are going to set for themselves, as long as they know how to, how to get there, the work ethic, the resilience, the perseverance and the vision to get there, um, I think that's a huge tool to be able to have in a toolbox as you move forward. So that's, that's advice that I would give. Great. Mine, I'm going to keep it short for a change. <laughs> Fail fast and learn fast. We, we follow that in Blue Spurs as a company. Um, the other one I would mention is every day teach something and learn something. Two key things to do. That's it. A wise mentor of mine once told me uh, that a good leader is not the quarterback of the team. A good leader is the blocker who, uh, who, who creates pathways for people to score touchdowns. And I think uh, we have a responsibility to, uh, to create resources and, and to, um, to create gateways for our young people to be successful and to choose their own paths. Uh, but they don't, know, they don't necessarily know how to naturally do that. It's our jobs to... Uh, to create opportunities for them, to let them embrace them, uh, embrace those, and and to take them and make them meaningful for themselves. Great. So I think we have maybe two or three minutes. If anybody has a question. Scott Campbell with Opportunities New Brunswick. I'll ask my question, then I'll pass it along for others to ask their question. Uh, first of all, brilliant, by the way, brilliant work. I think any time we have students excited to go to school, I think that's a real huge win. But I wanted to comment on Matt's um, point about digital liter literacy, one of the fundamentals being the ability to discern between accurate information and misleading information or inaccurate information. And so as a father of a 15-year-old daughter, I think I have a fair level of common sense and I can guide her to a certain extent. But my question to the panel is, are you aware of any programs that involve parents in becoming more digital literate so that they can help guide at home? Anybody? That's a really good question. I'm not, I'm not aware of uh, programs per se, but one thing I would uh, recommend, I, I think that we all need to do is that um, t communication is, is number one, is uh, to keep communicating um, with each other. What are you doing? Um, 
what kinds of what kinds of technologies are using, how are you using them, but I think um, to actually jump into them ourselves and, and to try and immerse ourselves in, in the same tools or the same uh, technologies in the same practices that um, our sons and daughters are in that way to uh, if we understand the mediums that uh, that our young people are using we can better support them we can better relate to to them and uh, be there for uh, a shoulder to cry on or uh, support or an encouraging word I mean I think I think the more uh, that we immerse ourselves in what our, our kids are doing, I think uh, the better prepared we are to help them. If I can add, we uh, at Cyber Lunch Academy, we actually run sessions for parents, internet security uh, for parents specifically. We do it twice a year in collaboration with Trend Micro. Those are free for anyone who wants to know and help uh, their kids. Um, so yeah, the next one I believe is coming in September, so you can find more information on the website. The neighborhood together and we can compete against the kids or something. <laughs> Enter our own team. <laughs> anyway, thank you. All right, I guess that's, that's all. My very sincere thanks to the panelists for joining us and my very sincere thanks for all of you for joining us. It's been a wonderful discussion, I think. Uh, big round of applause. <laughs> <laughs>